checking microphones. Yes, we're ready. All right, good evening, everyone. Oh. Uh, all right, hang on one second. Okay, thank you. Sorry, minor technical difficulty here. I'd like to uh, call to order the joint meeting of the Katati City Council and the successor agency to the former Katati Community Redevelopment Agency for this Tuesday, February 14, 2023. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone, and thanks for all of you uh, joining us, um, keeping you away from your, your family. So we appreciate that, that you're here with us. Um, with that, um, could we have a roll call? Councilmember Rivers. Here. Councilmember Lemus. Here. Councilmember Ford. Here. Vice Mayor Sparks. Here. Mayor Harvey. Here. Thank you. So um, if you wouldn't mind, please joining me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Thank you for that. So we will um, move on to the next item, which is approval of the minutes and notice of waiving of reading of all resolutions and ordinances introduced and or adopted under this agenda item. So um, any questions on the minutes? Anyone have any questions? Okay, then I will um, open this up for public comment. Um, anyone in the audience wish to speak on the minutes of January 24th? I am seeing none. Uh, Kevin, do we have anyone in, on Zoom? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you would like to make a public comment on approval of the minutes, please use the raise hand icon. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Then I will bring that back and I would be looking for a motion. Move to approve the minutes. I'll second the motion. A motion and a second, all in order or <laughs> in agreement. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Not seeing any, then that passes unanimously. Uh, then we will move on to announcements. So meeting orientation for new attendees and viewers in conformance with the Brown Act and the adopted City Council rules, the meeting agenda includes items labeled as action items where the City Council will consider the item and citizens are afforded the opportunity to provide comments relevant to the item being discussed. The meeting agenda also includes a citizen's business item which is the designated place on the agenda where citizens have the right to say whatever they wish. The City Council may or may not choose to respond to comments as the government code allows. However, if the City Council declines to respond, it should not be perceived as giving credence to or agreeing with any statements that the City Council or its members believe are incorrect, misinformed, or purposely biased. Next, Measure S supports police services, a variety of recreation programs for all ages, and the maintenance of our streets, parks, and public buildings. See details on the web at katadicity.org. Next, citizens interested in receiving City of Katadi community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up with Nixel by downloading the Everbridge app from the iOS or Android app store or by texting your zip code 94931 to 888777. Next, like always, we love to hear from you, so please feel free to contact the city at 707-792-4600 or info at katadicity.org. If you have a non-emergency issue after normal business hours, you can contact us at 707-792-4611. And of course, if you have an emergency, please contact 911. Continue to look for updates on the city's website and social media channels available on Facebook, Instagram, and Nixle. 
So with that, um, we will move to the next item, which is approval of the fin final agenda. Are there any changes? Thank you, Mayor. No proposed changes tonight. No proposed changes, okay. So um, since this is an action item, I will open it up for public comment. Anyone on Zoom wishing to make a public comment? Please raise your hand. Uh, we do have, oh, we do have a public comment on approval of the final agenda. Okay. Uh, Marone Moraz, uh, Generation Housing. Please go ahead. Oh, my mistake. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to speak on item number um, seven. Um, my, my bad. Okay. <laughs> That's right. We'll give you another chance later. Thank you so much for that. Um, any other hands? I see no further hands raised. So, okay. Mayor Harvey, that'll end the Zoom public comment. Thank you. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak on approval of the final agenda? Seeing no hands or no one running up to the podium. I will close um, public comment on that item and we will move on with the agenda. So the next item is citizens business and public comment for the consent calendar items. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on any items listed on the consent calendar or any matters not listed on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any item not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to City Council Policy 2021-01, comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes in length per person for matters not on the agenda and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. The mayor may extend the time for a reasonable time where there is a disability accommodation that has been requested. So with that, I will open up um, citizens' business and we'll start this time here. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak on either uh, citizens' business or items on the consent calendar? Seeing none, um, Kevin, could we see? Yes, thank Zoom you, Mayor audience. Harvey. Uh, speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you would like to make a public comment for citizens' business or consent calendar items, please use the raise hand icon at this time. Ramon Moraz, Generation Housing, please go ahead. Thank you very much, and sorry about that. I jumped the gun earlier. Uh, good evening, Mayor Harvey, by Vice Mayor Sparks, Council Member and Staff. My name is Ramon Miraz, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement at Generation Housing. We wanted to take a minute to strongly support Qatari seeking designation as a pro-housing jurisdiction. This status will open Qatari to new funding opportunities for housing, transit, and infrastructure from the state. And there's a lot the city should take credit for. While the city's housing element process is still open, the city can still have policies that meet the pro-housing criteria before final approval. So we believe this is the time to get those policies incorporated. We have studied winning proposals from all over the state and are monitoring the increasing number of designations being awarded. And we urge you, urge you to consider two lessons from that research. First, the designation is awarded based on a point scale. And the higher the points, the more competitive your grant applications are. And in other cases, the more funding you are entitled to. As the total number of awarded cities goes up, nine cities jurisdictions as of February, there's 15 more in the pipeline, the more of a liability a lower score can be. In order to maximize the impact of a designation, we recommend taking the full time to develop a strong application to help win Qatari more funding from the state. And second, because the designation is about more than hitting a certain number of housing units, but also about changing policies that make it easier. <laughs> to complete developments, we encourage the planning staff and the city council to coordinate closely. The planning department will rely on the council to pass legislation that meets the designation criteria. So we ask council to support the planning department staff as much as possible by committing to specific specificity and timelines on each policy, because maintaining the designation over the course of two years depends on enacting them. In addition to seeking us out for questions, we encourage you to reach out to the Department of Housing and Community Development 
to get the early input on policies that they are awarding. They are very welcome in that dialogue. Thank you for your guidance, and we look forward look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, anyone else? Uh, there are no further hands, so Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, we will then move on to the consent calendar. Are there any uh, questions or items that the council would like to pull? No? Okay, then I will be, uh, since we've already had public input on that, then I would be looking for a motion on the consent calendar. Move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Not seeing any. That passes unanimously. You guys are doing great today. <laughs> um, so we move on to item number nine, which is direction on future agenda items. Do we have? Yes. Thank you. Um, I spoke with the uh, city manager Obed uh, as per our process for this, um, and, and uh, we agreed that it would not take very much staff time, so it was okay to bring forward. Um, I'd like us to consider issuing a declaration of racism as a public health emergency and to draft a letter to the Board of Supervisors urging the County of Sonoma to declare racism as a public health emergency. Um, this is coming from, I attended a core meeting, Tati Organized Against Racism, and we had the um, chair of our local NAACP chapter attend in attendance, and this was a request that came from them. Um, and I looked into it and did some research and it seemed like a good idea. So I'd like to put it on a future agenda. Okay, I would like to understand more about that since that's not really our jurisdictional health is usually a county thing. So um, I would like to understand a little bit more. I don't want to overstep boundaries oh, um, since health emergencies are typically done at the county level. This is something that uh, several um, dozens of cities have done, so it's not unheard of. The city of Napa has done a declaration like this. <clears throat> and do they um, do their own health? I don't think, I think that it's more of a symbolic gesture that we're making a commitment to explore health um, discrepancies in our community and that we see it as a major problem. Okay. All right. And any objections to that? No, I'd support that being an agenda item. Okay. All right. Any other items? No, I support it as well. Okay. Then we will move on to the next item, which is public hearings. And we have one tonight, consideration of resolution granting approval of design review and a cottage housing development plan to allow the construction of four primary residential units and two accessory dwelling units at 902 East Katati Avenue. And do we have a staff report? <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Harvey, members of the council. My name is J.P. Harries. I'm a senior planner with the city of Katati, and I do have a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to provide. Um, tonight you're considering a resolution to uh, approve design review and a cottage housing development plan for a proposed project at 902 East Katati Avenue. Um, this be begins on package page 57. And um, I guess I'll just start out by saying this is the first cottage housing development plan that the city council is going to consider. We adopted the cottage housing ordinance in July of 2021. And, um, and at that time we looked at uh, quite a few different scenarios. One that we didn't look at was a small lot development um, like what's being presented here. So for staff this was exciting because um, it, it, was, it, was it was interesting to see how um, uh, a project proponent would, would actually apply this to a small lot. I think this is probably the smallest lot that we could do this because of the, the, the uh, well, the, the site design requirements that are part of the, of the cottage housing ordinance. But, but that's what we're talking about tonight, which is um, a proposal for a cottage housing project down 902 East Katati Avenue. 
And what you see in this image here is actually just one of, it's two buildings and they face each other. This is the facade of, um, of one of the buildings. And then uh, a rendering that doesn't include any of the landscaping and, and other interesting features that are actually part of the proposal. But, but it does give you an idea of what the structures would look like. Uh, not, oh, oops, I have the control. Give me one second. Okay, there it is. Oops. So there's a, this is located um, along East Katadi Avenue, <clears throat> kind of near the train station. That's the uh, train station that you see in the right hand, that uh, parking lot uh, image. That's where the train station is. Uh, directly across the street uh, is the, uh, the new development at Ryan Lane. And, um, and you can see it's pretty much in a generally a higher uh, density residential, higher res density residential area. There's a few commercial uh, businesses. There's a car wash a little bit to the east. There's the, and uh, all the way down on the left side of that image, there's the Chevron gas station. And there is an office building which is being converted into a preschool across the street also. And then this is just another aerial image kind of looking at how the site sits within these, this higher density uh, residential area. Oops. Whoa, whoa. So, um, like I was saying, this is a cottage housing project, and the proposal is to uh, demolish an existing, there's a single family home on that property now. It's in very, very, very poor condition. It's not habitable. Um, and, uh, and tear that down and construct four residential units and two ADUs. The parcel itself is 10,000 square feet in size. The units, um, the primary units are two bedroom and fairly small. They are 1,034 square feet to 1,291 square feet in size. And the ADUs are each 500 square feet. Um, as you saw with that, that first image, uh, it's basically two two-story duplex, duplexes facing each other with the, the smaller one-story ADU at the base. Um, there are some advantages to why the ADU is placed the way that it is, um, and I will discuss that a little bit later. Um, those two duplexes face a central common open space, and that open space uh, has shared amenities. This is consistent with the cottage housing ordinance. Um, as far as parking, there are two garage parking spaces for each primary unit and one covered guest space. So that provides um, nine parking spaces. Yeah, and, um, well, and then here I mentioned again, the ADUs at the rear. Uh, by placing the ADUs at the rear, they can take advantage of reduced setbacks that are provided for ADUs, um, which they have done. And also we liked how it allowed the development to transition to, to the development behind it, which is one and a half, one, one to one and a half story high. So rather than two story coming right up to the one story, it, gives, it provides a nice transition. And you'll maybe be able to see how that works here. And so this is, um, as you were, the top image is, pers is as if you were on East Katadi Avenue Kind of looking between the buildings, that's kind of what you would get. It's porched, um, and that porch is kind of married down to the sidewalk. On either side, well, on either side of those, unlike on the, the, the left side, the east side, uh, that fronts a parking lot that serves a development off of Breen Lane. And then on the right side, that fronts the driveway. So there are no structures on the, on the, east or the west or the left or the right as you look at that image. And then you can see how it would look uh, as you face the building on that lower image there. So the zoning for this area is uh, medium density, or NM, neighborhood medium density. It allows for eight to 10 units an acre. 
on this particular project that would allow for 1.8 to 2.3 units under normal conditions, possibly three um, if you did uh, some work with the density state density bonus program, um, and you could do two ADUs. So this project, by taking advantage of the cottage housing provision, uh, gains a, a, an extra unit or two uh, that they can add to the property. Uh, the height in this district is 28 feet. They're proposing 26.4 at the highest points. And with the setbacks, they basically have complied with the setbacks. The, the front would be 20, the rear with the ADUs four, sides are five. Uh, the coverage in this area is 55% uh, max. Uh, this was recently increased, as some of you may recall, uh, I think with November, December. Actually, it might have been a little bit sooner than that. But uh, we recently increased that from 50%. However, they're proposing 45%. A big part of why they can get away with that much development and that little coverage is the whole drive area is going to be a permeable surface. This is encouraged in the cottage housing, so we're able to get a lot less uh, coverage uh, than you might normally get if you use like asphalt or concrete. And I mentioned the parking. Uh, there is something to say that under state law, you, in, in, especially in this particular area, we cannot require parking for ADUs. Um, there's, they, they st well, there is a way that they could still park ADUs or park for the ADUs there. And one could be taking advantage of the guest spot. Other is tandem arrangement and kind of front of the garages. Or, and then the other would be parking on area streets in the, in the vicinity that are public streets. And I can, talk about, it would be like Beverly Drive, across the street, Runner Park, Santero Way, not ideal, and then maybe the uh, Lancaster. However, we feel like it, it, the, the project provides basically one and a half parking spaces per unit, which given the size of the unit, it's not unreasonable. And then, so just how it meets some of the cottage housing features, the highlights, uh, the units are less than 1,500 square feet. As I mentioned, they range from 1,034 to 1,291. They do provide the 2,000, uh, because there's four units, they have to provide 500 square feet of open space each. That's 2,000. They've met that by providing 2,004. They are providing uh, just a little over 400 square feet of private space, uh, the central pervious driveway. The entry porches, it will include solar and EV charging, and, um, and they're taking advantage of the density, of, uh, the density increase. Whoops. This is a little hard to see, but this is kind of the site layout. The, the real community area is off to the right. Uh, that that uh, hatch mark area is the driveway, and you can start to get some of the landscaping uh, visible there, and then these renderings help to provide a little more imagery on that. And this would just be, this will just be a few slides to just walk you through the development. So this is starting at East Katati Avenue, uh, crossing the sidewalk, and, and then moving down the development into the common area. And that's it. And um, I will say that the project proponent, Noel Kirby, is here tonight. And I believe online we also have the, the architectural team. And um, so they're available to ask, answer any questions that you might have. And staff is recommending that the city council complete this public hearing and adopt a resolution approving design review in a uh, cottage housing development plan to allow the construction of four residential units and two ADUs at 902 East Katadi Avenue. And with that, I'm available for any questions or comments. Thank you. Um, one of the questions I had and something that had come up is garbage cans. And um, is that something that Recology would work on or the developer would work on with the residents here? Yes, and actually, but they've had some conversations with Recology, and that uh, Recology is pretty much just a 
Noel can get into more detail with that, but Recology has just said, yeah, we can serve the project. It's not a problem for them to serve the project. Um, I should say the bins, there, there's two store, there's two kind of, they're kind of hidden underneath those staircases, but there's bin storage areas. The bins are going to be shared amongst the units, um, so it's not going to be, you know, tw the 24 bins. It's going to be, they don't need that many bins, but they're going to, they'll have to figure out what it is going to be over time. But the conversations have been with, had with Recology, and they don't see any problem with serving the project. And one other question I had is, um, are these market rate apartments, so will there be any uh, affordable housing included in this, in these units? These are proposed to be market rate. Um, so nothing deed restricted at this point. They will have to participate by paying our in lieu fee because if you are building less than 10 units, you can pay into the in lieu fee. I will say the units are small enough that we view that they're probably going to be, there's an affordability by design component that goes into this 500 square foot. These are going to be uh, rental units, I should also say. Uh, like 500 square foot ADU is going to have a built-in limit on what you can ask for it. Um, so, thanks. You answered several of my questions in response to Councilmember Lemus's question. Um, I'm wondering if the new Vernerf, however you say that ordinance applies to this project. It feels like this is exactly what it was designed for, but you didn't mention it meeting any of those criteria. It, it does not because it doesn't have uh, the lengths that we require for the Vooners, but they, we talked about it actually and wanting them to include what they could do with, uh, with that ordinance. Um, also, this came in before that, that ordinance was passed, so oh. they are kind of exempt from it. However, we did talk about it, and we felt like they, they did try to do that by, if you, let me go back a few slides. And, well, by bringing the, I don't try, I guess I can't go backwards. Yeah, we'll stop right there. So, uh, well, yeah, go one more. So it's not just a straight in drive. It kind of, it is, it tries to break it up a little bit. It does use an alternative surface than, than the roadway. So there is this like, um, kind of separation of the roadway from the driveway. And, and it does kind of come right up to where the, uh, kind of the community area is. There's not really much more room to do anything like that. And typically, I, I can't, maybe Noah has, can recall the distancing. We just don't have the distance that we normally would require with a runner in a multifamily project. I think we want 60 feet in or something like that. I, I don't. Often arterial. Yeah, often arterial. So you would need more depth to do a true runner. So this entire parking area is within 60 feet of the arterial? Pardon? This entire parking area is within 60 no. feet of the arterial? No, no, no. <laughs> so I would just add, so the project was exempt from the Vunerf requirement, so we didn't analyze it per the Vunerf, but um, speaking from memory of the ordinance, it doesn't meet all of the specific criteria, one of which would be the distance of the Vunerf beginning from the East Katati setback, because that is an arterial street. Uh, and then uh, obviously the vehicular traffic cannot travel through the shared communal space as would be expected with the Vunerf. Um, however, this project does incorporate significant amount of Vunerf-like features. Thanks. That's um, hi, I wanted to ask, because um, I, I was looking at the um, designs and I think it's really great use of the space. One of the, so one question about uh, when you said that they can serve it, um, does that mean Recology is going to pull in to this space, or does that mean it's going to be out on East Katati? Yeah, it, it, maybe Noel can add to this as well. Right now, they haven't committed one way or the other. Um, I think they're waiting to see how the project looks. I don't know, but they've, they've, we've, we've asked that specifically, are you going to put the bins inside or outside? Um, the conversation came up at Planning Commission, 
And there seem to be kind of various opinions on whether or not the truck should pull into that area, especially given the permeable surface area. Um, as well, there are, you know, I'm a little concerned about bins on East Katati Avenue. So um, we just don't know uh, how they plan to serve it yet. They just, at this point, kind of almost feel like we're asking them silly questions. <laughs> Okay, well, they, I just I just saw a number of letters about that. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I the think packet. the people on Green Way are, you know, they don't want they they, they like to pull off to the to, before they pull into Green Way to kind of get off the travel lane of East Katati Avenue, and they're concerned that the bins would be in that area. That's around. almost like a de deacceleration kind of lane, kind of safety lane, and also helps with visibility. Right. I mean, yes, yeah, so we just don't know how Recology is going to want to do it at this point. Okay. But and we also, there's not the number of bins that I think people are concerned that there's going to be. So. Uh, okay. And yeah. then my second question is, I was looking at the designs and I struggled to see where the visitor parking was. Can you just show yeah. us where? Yeah. It's hard to see. But this Like I see one, the garages, just yeah. not the visitor parking. Let's go back to this. I think it's in, if it's not, Okay. So those, oops, why is this going? Oh no, go back to the, <laughs> all the way to the very beginning. That there, stop there. Um, could you make the, make it larger so we're not a shared screen? So those are two car parking garages right. there. And the guest parking is that center area. Okay, that little space in between. That little space in between. That It's not, does not have a garage door on it. So it's just, you know, as a guest, they wouldn't have a garage. You know, they would pull into that space. Okay. But so it meets our standard for a parking space, which is 9 by 24, or okay. 9 by 18, excuse me. So that makes 10 spaces then, right? No, no, that, that's only 9 um, because there's 2 for each primary unit. Right. So that's 8. And then we have one guest parking space. Oh, there isn't one the, on the, the other, other side? The other facade is designed a little more differently to give more downstairs room to, to one of the other projects. Uh, excuse me, one of, one of the units. So the other fa facade or the other building, I think if you look at page, if you're used to looking at floor plans, page, of your packet page. A2.0 is the plan page that has. Yeah, I'm going to that very, on my packet's very small. It's number 68, I think, package page 68. Yeah, that's right. We don't have packet page numbers on the plans. Oh, you don't. Okay, yeah, then I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, we do. I see it. 68. Oh, okay. Online, I see it. It's the A2.0 one? That's correct. Okay. Um, I see what you're saying. Okay. So, so then for the ADUs, I don't know, I, I have an ADU at my house and we have one couple live there and they have two cars, mm -hmm. right? So with two ADUs with four cars and one spot for both, that's the, they're going to end up on the street, right? Is that the presumption? I mean, if, yeah, if they're either going to end up, if assuming everyone has the cars, the two cars, they're either going to end up um, parked in a tandem arrangement on, on that parking area, so there'll be people parking in front of the garage, or yeah, they're going to end up on, on, on the street. And you have to realize, State law doesn't allow us to, to basically ask for that parking. We can't require parking for ADUs, especially when they're right next to a, a, high, a high quality transit station. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, on that same topic, did, didn't I read in the packet that it also might be possible for the landlord to arrange to assign some of the garage parking to the ADUs? If yeah, the, the landlord can do a few different things. And um, if, if this is the primary concern of the council is the parking, let me talk about some of the, the things that I've discussed with them. So the landlord could do, because these are not gonna be individual owned units, they have discretion over who parks where and can assign lots accordingly. 
Additionally, they could, um, we could adopt a policy that um, it says that the, one of my concerns is that they use these for storage um, and, and not for parking. And um, which, which is, which usually is what's causing the parking problems that we experience in Katadi. It's not that we, our parking is so small, it's that people aren't using the parking. <laughs> Um, so we could have them have a policy that there is no uh, storage in here, that you have to park your vehicles in, inside there. A kind of more extreme uh, approach we could take here, and, and you know, I'm not fond of it architecturally, but it might be a solution, um, is we don't have those be garages and have those be open carports. Um, which would, well, one, it would prevent them from becoming workshops and storage areas, and might have, and might, and then there'd be more than one space for for each unit, and that might be a, an approach to take that the council could consider. And I've talked about it with the, with the developer, and they're amenable to that. Yeah, I, I am still a little bit worried about the parking because there is no parking on East Katati Avenue. No. I do not want people running across the street, across five lanes of traffic to go park on Beverly. They will try and park on Breen, which is already too small, and those places have one-car garages and people are parking there. And Santero, as you pointed out, is really that's not a place to go. So I, I really want to be sure that either via a parking management plan or so, what do we have so that, that the vehicles that they are in control of are parked on site because it's not a neighborhood where you can park, you know, in, in front and, and kind of walk up. And with the garage doors, I understand what you're saying. It, it makes it a little bit more private, but people aren't going to want to be having someone in an ADU park in front of their garage. And it's kind of like if there's one guest thing, spot, that means guests can't use it and the ADUs will have to use it. And because we live in a college town, we know that it's likely that it's going to be college students that it'll get rented to. They will have a car. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to you know, from the get-go set up a situation where, you know, people are fighting over where to park their vehicles. So I don't know how we manage that. If it's a management plan, you know, assigned parking, you know, but it seems like we have to at least acknowledge that each of the units and each of the ADUs are going to have a vehicle. So how do you... You know, how, how do you manage that? Yeah, well, I offered some suggestions. Um, I can also, you know, say with other communities, we have we have one of the I wouldn't we have just basically two parking spaces per unit, no matter of size. It could be a six bedroom home, it could be a studio apartment. We require the same amount of parking, which is two units per size. A lot of communities, and in fact, our um, housing element uh, talks about us reevaluating parking and and considering the amount of parking based on square footage. So the nine spaces breaks out to one and a half parking spaces per unit. And if you start to look at other jurisdictions as well as what's in our own housing element, which we haven't brought forward yet, but that's we're completely in line with. Part, that level of parking for that size of unit. Um, there's nothing really out of whack here. I, 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 I share your concerns. I understand that, but when but, you put a door on something, it's mine. <laughs> and that's just the way people sure. kind, of, kind of see that. They're not going to, I'm imagining that the person in the main residence is not gonna say, here, have my garage door opener, and you can park your um, ADU, unit, ADU unit car in my garage. I, I just, <laughs> I don't see that happening. Yeah. Um, would it be possible to hear from the developer about what his thoughts about carport would be? Or would that, I'm curious to know if that would increase your costs or? Oh, wait. Yeah. Oh. 
Hi, uh, my name's Noel, I'm the owner of the property. And I'm o completely open to suggestions with the park and I definitely don't want it to be a problematic thing. I think what where JP is leaning with the no garage door certainly rules away the possibility of the storage. I think the, having the garage door is ideal for safety. I'm sure people would be happier to have it that are staying there. But at the same time, we're happy to work on recommendations, what you guys think is the best solution for the parking. Um, I know we're inside the limits with the parking, but I completely understand where you're going given the neighborhood. So I think a parking plan in place, and we're not, like each of the main units doesn't necessarily have to have the two units. We're willing to divide it up on your recommendation to what you think is the best thing. When I'm up here, I'll also say in the garbage, I've been talking to Ecology. They said they do pick up on 902 East Katati. They said they will give us an answer. They're working on it. I've been pushing them hard. It's hard to get an answer from them. So my hands are tied a little bit on it, but I'm ringing them every two or three days, I promise. <laughs> I'm looking to get answers on it too. Okay. And if there's any any other questions, just I'm willing to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Did you Sure. I had a question. Um, when I'm looking at the at the the illustration of the housing, yeah. is there a way to make those two car garages um, two? You know, make them single doors. So there's one, two, three, four, five kind of doors there, um, garage doors, so that then they can be assigned kind of easier. Um, versus it looks like there's two here and two there, so it looks like they belong to that. I I'm sure it's a possibility. I can't give an honest answer because I don't know about the space exactly what's required. JP might be able to answer that, or the architect, he's on Zoom. But I don't know if it's if a divided wall leaves it too tight. Mm -hmm. I don't know to, to inside the requirements for single. But I think that would make it more kind of like they're assigned versus they belong to this unit or that unit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. Um, it looks like the architect has his hand up on Zoom, if we'd like to go to him. <laughs> sure. Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Okay, thank you. My name is Wangcho C. Sidor Jr. I'm the architect for the project. I just wanted to, I have actually a different presentation, but I'll, I'm going to skip through that and, and go straight to the issue at hand regarding the parking. Uh, one suggestion that that um, we could provide this is have another guest parking a second guest parking on the opposite side on the other building to match uh, the upper one. So right now, we it's a little different on the ground floor where the second unit, unit number two, uh, is enlarged. It has a ground floor habitable space. And instead of that, we can do exactly the same thing as we are proposing on the opposite building, which is four uh, garages with a guest parking in the middle. So that would give us a total of 10 parking spaces instead of nine. Now I haven't, I haven't, I was trying to contact uh, Noel, the, the owner, uh, to ask him if that would be acceptable, but I thought I'd just bring it up here now, because that would be an easy change for us to do if he's acceptable to it. Thank you for that. Yes, Kay? Yeah, I'm just kind of building on Sylvia's idea. Uh, if um, having the the two car garages turned into one is, or, you know, two car garages turned into two one car garages, um, another possibility would be to make, uh, put a door on the guest. Um, uh, spaces and that in that way they could be individual um, garages for the ADUs. That might be another way of doing it. I don't I don't know if the space would allow that. I guess JP along along those lines there is are we required to have guest parking? Can it just be that it's only um, residential parking and then if people happen to have guests then you might be able to get into your suggestion of tandem parking if I had guests at my house, but that way. Um, With cottage housing, remember it's a, it's a unique ordinance. You have 
you have authority to do really whatever you want, especially within reason. If there's a certain standard like that, that that you have the one guest parking, you can easily eliminate that and say we're satisfied with the parking under these conditions. Um, that authority is given to you within the ordinance itself to do to tweak a project the way you may like. That's really embarrassing. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so yes, the answer to that is yes. And then also, if you do want to go down this path, I don't. I would, you know, we can condition it that they, if um, that they either provide individual garage doors or they make a carport. I don't know if it will all fit that way. Once you start putting garage doors, you need more space just because there's rails and there's there's it's just equipment. Right. Um, and they've kind of really maximized the, the, the amount of space, the building, you know, that they can put on a small space, a lot like this. So we could work on something like that where either you carport it or you individual lot or you provide the two additional spaces for the ADUs and then guest parking will have to fend for itself either in front or, or something like that. Um, as well as include a, a parking management plan. Um, that's an easy condition that I can I can add if the, so if the council chooses. Okay. So if, if I kind of can summarize what what I've heard folks say is that we want to be sure that we're accommodating enough parking for the the four units and the ADUs. However, combination of you achieving that including a, man, a parking management plan so that we kind of know that it's uh, thought through rather than just haphazard and how you design it. I've heard some different um, ways to design that in a step. I don't feel like that's a consensus. We haven't even okay. had our discussion yet. Okay. We haven't had public comment. So I'm, I'm completely held off because I'm done with okay. questions. I'm waiting for a conversation. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so thus far, that, that's what I've heard people um, say. So any other questions from anyone? Okay, then I will open this up for the public hearing. Um, so we'll start here in the audience. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? Not seeing any, then we will go to the Zoom attendees. Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand icon. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, then I'll bring it back. And so, what you, you want to start there, Ben? Sure. Yeah. Uh, a couple things. First, the garbage bin issue. Um, I'm, uh, in general, uncomfortable with with just saying whatever Recology wants to do, they can do. I, I think we need to start thinking about: Is it appropriate to have uh, garbage bins that completely obstruct the bike lane, at least one, usually two days a week? That's problematic to me. Um, so I think to just keep saying, yeah, just do whatever you want to do is problematic. So I think we need to, as a city, think about what's, how do we want to handle garbage along streets that don't have parking and have a bike lane, et cetera, um, and not just leave it up to Recology. So I'd like you know, the city to actually be involved in that discussion and not just say, applicant, talk to Recology and work out whatever you want. That's one request. Um, I don't see a condition that we could put on this project that makes sense to me um, unless it is reasonable to put a condition that, that garbage pickup be inside the, uh, off the street, you know, that the truck pulls off. The, the bins not be placed in the street on East Katati. I'm not sure how to make that work. Maybe they have to build a little, you know, a little cutout into the parkway where the bins sit so they're not out in the bike lane. I'm not sure what the possible resolution there is. On parking, I agree with JP that the big issue is that the biggest issue we have down there with existing nearby developments is that people don't use their parking for parking. And so I've, I'd like several other possibilities here. I think putting more garage doors on actually goes in the opposite direction and will make more of the more of the spaces into workshops and storage. On the other hand, I don't like a can't use them for storage uh, rule because then a family that moves in without a car, which is actually possible there, just a block from the smart station, would be penalized by having a big empty space. So um, I like the leave off garage doors and make them carports. 
and and have a you know condition of leasing that you you your carport always has to be available to park a car. Um, that seems like a reasonable way to get there. I'm I'm comfortable with the amount of parking. I think nine spaces for a total of whatever it is, 5,000 square feet, is fine. So I'm fine with that. Thanks. Okay, Sylvia. Um, no, I think the other input that I had was just about um, the garbage collection. Is what I thought I heard is that because of the pervious pavement, it's a little more difficult for the bigger trucks to come in. Does Recology ever do? Can it be like an agreement that on that street they use a smaller truck or something? that goes and picks up the garbage versus the big heavy duty, you know, uh, heavy duty trucks that come in. Um, so that was a thought that I had. Other than that, I think I was fine with the project. And I still kind of like the idea of kind of looking at the garages and seeing if um, either turn them, turn them into individual ones with doors. And I know that there's spacing issues, but I think also um, privacy and security for the cars and, and things like that. So um, that's just a thought. but. You know, whatever kind of staff and, and developers, but uh, just making space so that ADUs have a place to park as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, regarding the parking, um, I, I think we've got, it, correct me if I'm wrong, we've got 10 bedrooms in this whole project. So for me, nine spots for 10 bedrooms seems reasonable if there might be a couple that only has one car or a single person occupying. Um, I, I tend to like the idea of using a carport rather than a garage, um, just because I feel like that would alleviate most of the problems, given that you might have one unit that only has one car and another unit with two, and if all the spots are available to be divvied up, then it would, seems like um, that could work well. And I know that people are very creative. One of my best friends lives directly next door to this project, and I go over there every Wednesday night to play board games. And um, <laughs> so I'm very familiar with the area, and um, what he does is he's one person living in a two-bedroom unit, and he has an informal arrangement where a neighbor pays him some amount of small amount of money and uses his second parking spot. So, you know, if the spots are available to be shared, um, people will work it out. I feel like people will work it out, especially if they know what they're getting into when they move into the place. Um, on a broader, pers from a broader perspective, I just wanted to make a comment since this is our very first cottage housing project. We worked very hard on this ordinance over the last couple years, and I'm really happy to see it coming to fruition. At the time that we made the ordinance, I advocated, um, and I was very much in the minority on this viewpoint, but I advocated that we make these projects by right, that if we, if a developer came in and met all of the cottage housing requirements, uh, that it could be approved without uh, city council discretion. It was decided at the time that the council really needed that discretion in order to serve as a safety valve for problems that might come, like this parking issue maybe would be one of them. Um, but so we do have discretion over this, but I would like to strongly advocate for us sending a message that if a project that, that meets all the requirements like this comes through, then we're going to strongly support it. Um, it because uh, I'd like future developers who are looking at how this project came through to see it as sort of like a, a certainty that they can rely on this ordinance that if they follow all the things staff wants them to do and follow the rules of the, of the cottage housing ordinance, then unless there's some really unforeseen problem, then that project's going to get approved without us uh, nitpicking it to death. So I, I think we're <laughs> kind of headed in that direction and I'm glad to see that and I'm really happy to see this project. So thank you for bringing it forward. Okay. Um, I feel like I brought up the concerns that I had and, and like I said at the beginning, I'm really excited to see this and it looks really cool and um, like I said, I have an ADU and I think they're lovely and wonderful and a great option for smaller families or students. So I think this is really great. Okay, um, I have one more question, JP. Um, there's a lot of trees on that property. Will they all be going? Yeah, the existing, the, the, the existing, there's, there's trees both on site and, and surrounding it. The existing trees will be gone and then the landscape plan that's proposed in the thing will be the one that's installed. As well, they'll be installing the, the street trees in the, in the, uh, in the, in the landscape medium between the, the sidewalk and the, and the, and the curb. 
Now, yeah, I, I saw that there were trees back there, but it was unclear whether, it, especially in the back, yeah. backing those existing condos, were we leaving the existing trees or were we replacing the trees? You know, because those folks have already been there and they're used to kind of having that buffer. And that's you, you, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I know there were trees on both sides of the fence, and I, I'm sorry, I just can't recall okay. if it were the, the, the I, if the significant ones were one side or the other. Okay. I know what you're talking about, but you know we can look at that a little closer with the landscape plan, and if there is a tree that can be preserved, uh, you know we're talking about a small space, four feet back there, and so we don't want to make sure we don't compromise the root system and then create a hazard. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a closer look and see if there's something we could preserve. I've been viewing it as the site would essentially be uh, okay. cut down. It was, and, it was a little unclear. I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't sure. Yes, Kay? I just had what she just reminded me. Um, the one other comment is um, a lot of the um, plants and trees and everything that was included in the landscaping look like they were all non-native. And I would just love to offer that it would be really great whenever possible to include native drought tolerant type of um, landscaping moving forward for our flora yeah, and fauna. I, I, yeah, of course. I, I, I want to say that I, when I reviewed it, I found them to be California native. Now, whether or not they were Sonoma County native is a, is a different is a different question, but I, I'll look at that. Yeah, no, a lot of them were. Yeah. I just want to, you know, give a yay, that's great. Please do more of that. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank course. you. Okay, um, I think that you've heard a lot about the garbage, so I think that you can you can help with, with getting that resolved. I know that that, that tends to be an issue. I concur with um, Council Member Ford. We, do, we don't want those out, out in the street. Um, I don't know whether they've considered doing, um, I don't know what you want to call it, group garbage rather than individual bins. I know that that's been a really um, big um, downside to Santero Way is everybody has three bins and they all drag them out and you can't even get down that street on garbage day. So if there are kind of ways that we can work towards managing that when we have a development, I think better off because even at um, uh, one, two, three, six units, you're gonna have, you know, six times three is 18 bins. <laughs> well, they're going to be shared bins. It's shared bins. It's shared bins? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so then we, they won't be drug out to. No, they will. They, right. Uh, we don't know the exact number of bins yet. Okay. Because, but we don't anticipate that the 500 square foot ADU one bedroom is going to be filling up the same size bin as you might be envisioning. And they will be able to share the, the larger 64 gallon bin, I, you know. Okay. It's, it's quite well, a bit. I mean, I use a 32 gallon bin. I put it out once a month, and you know. So, it's, with the but anyway, I I understand it. We do have. I'm I'm looking for the the condition that we do have about working with recology, and we also have a planning commissioner that that works with recology that Correct. can help us with this. What I can't promise the council, I don't feel like I can promise the council, is that we can tell Recology how they're going to do their pickup. But we can certainly apply pressure and, and make recommendations about what we'd like to see there. Yeah, so I agree with um, Council Member Ford that at some point we may need to kind of look at that and, and kind of say this is what we want in these type of developments because I agree with um, Vice Mayor, I think this is our first one, but if this is the direction that we're going in, we, we you know, maybe need to give some thought about that from the perspective of the cot cottage ordinance so mm -hmm. that we can kind of get our, get our arms around that so in the future we're better on that. Um, and then the parking, I think you have a whole lot of input on that. Um, I think a parking management plan is going to be key. And um, while I would hope that um, there would be fewer cars, I, I don't know that we can assume that the ADUs will have zero cars. Um, so however um, they want to manage that um, and however you guys agree to that, I 
think that we have to come to some place where everybody has a spot. I don't think that it's fair to, you know, kind of leave it up up to, to people to fend for themselves because, you know, it's going to be last person in. It's going to be left out in the cold. So with that, yes. Well, so I'd like to propose that we add a condition that the garage doors be removed okay. and that the space, the parking spaces be carport style rather than enclosed garages for the purpose of ensuring that they stay as parking. The applicant was open to that possibility and I'd, I'd like to see that added before we approve it. And that would help then with the um, not having to redesign that other that other unit, right. correct? Because right. then there would be. Well, it would, it would still be nine spaces, but they could be individually assigned as needed. Right. Rather than, you know, automatically go with the primary unit. Right, right. Does everyone okay? Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea, and I, I feel comfortable with the, the number of spaces at that point. Um, this is so close to the smart station. This is where we're supposed to be doing high density housing that's not car dominated. It's right by the train station. So it's not impossible that someone could choose to live there without a car. And we're also, do, this, this structure will be here for a long time. So we're thinking about how cars are being used now, but this structure will probably still be here in 50 years when it could look very different and it's still gonna be next to the train station. So I, I like the idea of um, giving those people in that one unit a little more, a little more living room <laughs> instead of giving it to a car. Yeah. Is everybody okay with adding that as a what? I, I see you're making a face. <laughs> well, I, I don't know because our garage was turned into an ADU. I, I I know I really miss having a garage, and. The idea of a garage for me is a door, and I don't think we have a lot of crime here, but it certainly feels safer to have my car behind a door rather than just out. Um, I think this, you know, it is kind of set back, and it's, you'd have to go all the way into there to, to find the car, so I think that, that changes it a little bit, but I'm thinking, you know, young woman, a student by herself, you know, coming in at night. I don't know. I just, I see garage doors as something of a security thing, not just for the cars, but for the people driving. So I don't know. I, I, I hesitate, but I'm not sure I would vote against it. Uh, along to, to kind of follow on to that, are the units, are there doors from the garage into the units? There are, okay. I just was trying to follow along with that, that safety concern yeah, there. Yeah, if we did individual garage, there that might have to be some modification. But right now, yeah, it's there is access from the garage directly to the primary units. Okay. So we'd have to do, the, the tweaking that it would require is not much, like it's easy to do. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I'm happy to let the council debate this further and, and go with any direction that you and the, uh, the project you know, applicant is willing to go to. So are you, are, do you feel that strongly about it that you wanna rediscuss it or are you okay with us removing the doors and leaving it as carports so that everybody has a spot? Well, doesn't it, I mean, I guess this would be, a, I don't know who to ask this question of, but would that reduce the value of the homes as well to not have garages and rather have carports? Anybody know? Um, if the council could go either way, and, and I would like to get the applicant to come up and agree to one way or the other, you could leave it to us to decide. You know, we're, the message is clear. You want parking for each of the units. If we can do that with individual garage doors, or if the answer is going to be that we, you know, that it will be carports or some variation of or something along those lines, we can figure that out. I think. Um, and you're willing to get rid of the guest the the guest spot and not go to ten, or you know, 
Pardon? Not get rid of it. No, not get rid of it, but I mean, you mean having I guess 10 I was I guess I was nine. stuck on the counting the, the bedrooms or I don't know where I was, but um, Well he had said that they could match it so that it's ten. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. The architect had said that they could change the floor plan of the other building, and so that you could get an additional parking space. Um, I mean, I guess if, if I'm if I'm the holdout, then I, I could compromise. If we can have ten spaces, then I will give up the garage doors. It, well, I agree with um, Councilmember <laughs> Rivers. <laughs> I, I mentioned earlier that I think a garage would add more value and provide safety and security for the renter there. Um, but, you know, maybe if staff could come back with more information or should, do we need to make a decision today on that? We need to make a decision today. Mm -hmm. Okay. We either have to could condition it mm -hmm. or tell them what, what we want. Yes. So, <laughs> I don't know, it, probably when you were running elections, you've walked down Santero Way and <laughs> wa walked every house there. They all have garages and yet their cars are all in the street. That's the whole point of this discussion is, I mean, that's, that's too blanket a statement, of course. That's not true for everybody. But a large portion of garages are not used for parking cars. And that's what causes a huge part of our parking issue. And so if we say, leave them all as garages, then we're making the parking problem worse, not better. So we could try to write some condition that says the landlord will ensure that all garages are available for parking cars, but we don't have any way to, we're, we're not going to devote staff time, I hope, to going down there and checking every week that the, that the garages are available for parking cars, so I don't think that's a workable solution. So I'm trying to find a way to make sure we, carports are, uh, are easy to check that they are available for parking cars. And um, my, JP, the message for me is not every, every unit has to have a spot. The message is the spot should be flexible and, and available for cars, not used as workshops or storage spaces. So I'm okay with a condition that says somehow applicant will work with staff to ensure uh, parking design and management such that uh, all the design spaces are available for parking cars. Um, but I'm not okay with just saying, yeah, I'll give everybody a garage because then their cars are, they're running across East Katati <laughs> from Beverly, they're parking on Breen, they're, so I think we've got to find some way to ensure that those spaces are used for cars. I'm okay if, if they're behind garage doors, it's great, but they gotta be available for cars. Okay, I heard that. Yeah, I, your I thoughts, JP, Noah. <laughs> uh, looking at the floor plans, it would be a significant revision to provide individual garage spaces for each and allow access to those from those units. So, if they were to be carved up, the way the units are designed, it would affect the way that they're individually accessed. So, staff is, would recommend against that. Um, providing individual garages, so the two to, to now singles. I do agree that um, transitioning the design from garages to carports is the one that would likely address the concerns the most with regards to parking, although it doesn't address the uh, enhanced security you get by being able to park your vehicle in a garage. Uh, but I do, uh, we have had this conversation um, numerous times about having garages directly puts cars on the street because they're not always utilized for parking. And, and this has been a mantra that has come up. Large numbers of conversations we've had specifically about Santero have been this conversation about the trade-offs of garages versus carports. And a majority of the requests that I have gotten from citizens has been to not allow additional garages in these neighborhoods because they don't end up getting used for parking. Noah, can I ask you a question along those lines too? Is if they were garages, could those that belong to those units, could they then also be turned into a JADU? They could be converted. Which is to, to Ben's point that then they're not being utilized 
and I will say that there's <laughs> they, they, and I will say they couldn't all be converted. So there's there's interesting caveats with regards to JADUs and ADUs when it's multifamily. So it's it's good to to point out these are not individually owned. These are that we're gonna have one ownership and they're so when you have multifamily housing or apartment housing, there's limits on converting spaces to ADUs. So just okay. it, it's a little bit of uh, apples and oranges, but. But it was, it, I was trying to help with Ben's point that we also then, we want them to be used for parking the cars, not for other things, and that could be another thing. So, do, yes. So how about that last thing I suggested, which is a condition that the applicant work with staff to, to design and, and come up with a parking management plan to ensure that spaces are available for parking until the city reduces parking requirements below what they currently have, <laughs> you know. Because I do want to allow, in 50 years, I don't think we'll all be owning individual cars myself, and I, I certainly don't want to lock them into empty spaces once they're not needed. Um, could we could we say something like that? I, that I, I do think the applicant could be required to put a lease condition that garages be used for, if a vehicle is owned by the applicant, they have to use their garage for parking. I do think that could be a condition that would allow flexibility for non-car owning families and how they use their garage, but then also could allow the garage to remain and be forced to use be used as parking. Wait, what did you say that again? The lease could specify that if you own a vehicle, it has to be parked in your designated space and you can't not park there. And it appears the city attorney agrees. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, th this still doesn't quite work for me because it, it we're down back to not having anywhere for the ADU people to park because if everything's behind a garage door, then you lose that flexibility on who's parking where. Um, so I, <laughs> I think I'm I think I'm leaning towards. I'd really like to see a carport be a carport because it feels like that that's just a more elegant solution that's more flexible yeah you know along those lines of your safety is it is it more safe to have to um, park in a carport and get out or to possibly have to park a block or two away because that's the only place there is to park and have to walk to, to your unit because you're last person in and and uh, that get, that one guest parking spot's already used up and the doors are closed and yeah. Yeah, well that's why I said if we can have 10 spaces, then I'm okay to let go of the doors. So if we can have 10 spaces, if we can do the two that are like actually the same so that there's there's a space for every bedroom then I'm okay with them all being carports. And then there's no, we wouldn't necessarily call them guest parking. They would be a, assigned parking to those ADUs. Could I ask one other possibility? Sure. <laughs> and maybe, maybe the applicant or um, architect might respond. Would it be possible to give each of the, uh, the primary units a one car garage and and open up the, the in-between spaces to be carports. So it would be four single car garages and five open spa five carport spaces that could then be assigned as needed to the primary. So each primary would have one garage space with a door into their unit, but then there'd be five carport spaces that could be assigned by the leases to whoever, I mean, however the, o the owner, you know, leases them out. I like it. Does that make sense? Four and five. There'd be four one car garages and then the other spots would be carport. So the one so side would, would have three carport spaces so and the other side would have two. Serve the one as long as you put I disagree. We don't need ten. One and a half per unit is plenty. There's four. Six units with the ADUs that sticks all together. Right, there's six cool. units. My, it, so, um, as 
JP and Noah pointed out, many jurisdictions for houses this small have a one or one and a half parking spaces per unit requirement. That, that's not a new thing. That is how it's usually handled. And, um, and it's not one and a half spaces for this unit and one and a half spaces for that unit and one and a half spaces for that unit. It's nine units for the development, which then the owner would have to work with the, whoever's moving in and decide who gets them. So that's, that's a possibility. I'd be curious whether staff or the applicant has any thoughts about that different arrangement, which kind of splits the difference between eight garage spots and none. So I think, Sylvia, what he's saying is there's six units. So of the six units, some people may have um, two cars and some people may have one car and between the single garages and the carport spots, the nine should be enough to park cars. Yeah. That's what you're suggesting, yeah, right? <laughs> okay. Yes, you may. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Since we're talking about your, yeah, yeah. your development. No, no. So the, I think the overall problem is, is parking. And if we end up, as, as the architect mentioned, adding the extra guest, so-called guest space, that brings us up to 10 parking spaces. That therefore leaves us two for each primary unit and one for the ADU. They, they can all be open, they don't need to be garages, or four of them can be the double garage doors with the two open ones, and that way you have some flexibility. I'm open to doing it either way, leaving it all open if you think it's better from a parking point of view that forces people to park in there, but also leaving it open. But I think if we, if we move to the 10 spaces that are open, that way we ultimately have 10 parking spaces, which is more than the requirements. So I think overall, not to tell you it's your business, <laughs> but I think that, that that's the best way of, it, of fixing the parking, because then it's all the parkings being utilized. You have 10 spots. As you said, you've got one for each bedroom then. And I don't know, I think going for individual, I think it would change the appearance of the thing. Like it's very mixed and matched. And I don't know if it'll work with the floor plans also if you, the access points will work that way. But I think if we do the, that we end up with 10 open spaces, I understand where you're coming from where the closed garage door is better from a safety point of view, but it stops, as you said, forcing people to park there. So, and as you said, if we, if we end up using that storage, we're also pushing somebody away from parking. So I think the best plan is to leave it all open and have 10 spaces, and I'd be willing obviously do that. So that sounds reasonable. Okay. You okay? Um, I'm not happy to give more space over the cars. No. I, and there's no way this space should be required to have 10, 10 spots. So, But that's fine. I won't vote against the overall project, of course. It's a great project. Okay. So I'll, I'll compromise on the, the doors to get the 10th. If, if you're willing to compromise on the 10 to get rid of the doors. <laughs> Just saying, um, I, I agree. I think that 10 is too much. I think we should have nine, but um, I also support the project, so I'm not willing to vote no over that. Are we okay? We, we clear? <laughs> Are we clear as mud? <laughs> I would love to say yes, but okay. I didn't understand. I, what I sensed was there was a disagreement on, on the council on the number. I, I, I think we've got, we are agreeing that they're going to be open, and, and the applicant has said that, but I, I heard a disagreement from the council on the number of parking spaces. I think it was in that they were going to open up another one, so there's 10 parking spaces, but make, make them all open, carports. And right. that's where the and disagreement then, with some, um, some council members feel that 10 is too many, that 9 is enough. So he doesn't know I how many of confused. us think which. <laughs> Susan, you haven't weighed in. You're the only one who hasn't weighed in. Okay. Yet. Well, since parking is a continual problem, and while I would love for everyone to take the train and take their bikes and take everything, I think having gone out into the public so many times, parking is really what drives people bonkers. 
Um, and it, it, this is a great project and it looks beautiful. And I think keeping everyone on site and, and kind of working within that, I think for our first one, it feels to me that we should, you know, move forward with enough spots for everybody. What that's going to mean is if someone has guests, they're going to either have to tandem share or their guest is going to have to um, park somewhere else. But I, I want to make sure that everybody has a spot. I, I don't want to be last man out because <laughs> I know it would be me that would be <laughs> would be late and I'd pull it and there'd be no place to be. So that's kind of where I'm at. So we are, are you and uh, so I hear Sylvia and um, Kay and myself wanting 10 spots and you and Laura wanting nine spots. So are we, are you, do you want to? You can outvote us. <laughs> you have my permission. <laughs> okay. So this is public hearing. I can close the public hearing. We're, we're done and we need to, um, adopt the attached resolution granting approval of design review and cottage housing development plan to allow for construction of four residential units and two ADUs at 902 East Katati Avenue. So that's what we need to adopt. But if, if you want to add a condition, somebody has to fold that into the motion, right? With the condition of working, staff working um, with the um, owner to make sure that there are 10 parking spots with no doors. That's what I heard. And to um, have you work on getting the garbage squared away. However, that happens. Any other, and you will also make sure that the trees are kind of set the way they're, yeah. And yes, Kay? And native and native plants wherever possible and yes <laughs> and I, I just want to be clear are we making a suggestion about the plants or are we adding a condition because I don't feel comfortable adding a condition that sort of nitpicks at the level of what plants we plant okay it could be um, Madam Mayor if I may it could be a con it could be addressed as part there's a condition requiring a landscape plan and so that could be a suggestion that's folded into the plan at the time that it's submitted back to the city for review before we add any conditions, can staff remind us of our existing ordinances around drought tolerant and planting plans? Don't we have some ordinances that address those already? I thought we did. Yeah, we do. Uh, in my, our, like I said, my review was that they were native I, to California. I don't know how native K would like them to be like Sonoma County native, which are, you know, you got to go to the stock. The overriding the overriding condition is what's called the WELA, the Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. And that guides, um, you know, the type of plants that you can plant based on a water budget, uh, which is actually kind of dictated by the state at, at what level you can do. That's the primary objective. And then I think we have, I think, yeah, I want to say that they're mostly native. Unfortunately, we had the landscape architect at the planning commission and could have spoke to this directly. But I will take another dive at that and make sure that you know the majority, or the super majority, so to speak, is is native. Um, that was one of the things I felt impressed about in my in my recollection. You know, recalling the review was like, wow, they did a good job of picking native plants. Um, I'm not botanist though from Sonoma County that could tell you exactly if they're all Sonoma natives. And, and I don't necessarily have that be a condition. Okay, all right, that was my, okay, all right. Whenever I, possible. All right, and so you're okay with that? Yes. Okay, <laughs> everybody okay with that? All right, so those are the conditions that I have suggested, have, has anyone? So all we need is a motion to. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We did it. It was tough and <laughs> we have moved this on and thank you very much for um, bearing with us and um, thank you for um, coming forward and answering our questions.
So with that, we will move on to the regular agenda. And I believe that we are going to have a mid-year budget review. Um, I'm guessing that's probably Angela. Absolutely. Thank you, JP. Absolutely. I'll let, give JP a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> so good evening, Mayor, Council members, fellow staff, um, our greater community, uh, both here and remote tonight. Uh, we're presenting the mid-year report for the city as of December 31st, 2022. I have to apologize. The first page of the report that's in the packet somehow auto-generated. That will be replaced. It, it is in the actual Word document, correct, has the title. Kevin, you know, is amazing, but he didn't create the port. I did with my staff. So that will get <laughs> replaced and updated. Um, so within this report, I will go over the citywide all funds overview budget to actuals then drill down a little bit further into our major funds, which are comprised of our general fund and then our individual enterprise funds, then concluding with our overall cash and investments portfolio as of, again, the point in time of December 31st, 2022. So for the citywide, we're looking at all of the funds grouped by their specific fund type. So here's a summary of the citywide revenues and expenses compared to budget as of December 31st, 2022. So we're looking back in time, as well as the comparative actual revenues and expenses as of 12 31, 2022 for each fund type. So overall revenues and expenditures citywide are really in line with our expectations. And I know it seems odd to say that they're in line when you see this 33%. How can that be halfway through a year? But things are adjusted for actual cash basis um, compared to accrual basis, which you typically see in accounting. And again, the expenses are at 29% of budget overall. So again, as a reminder, most of the uh, activity for the city is managed within the general fund. The two other major funds are the enterprise services, which are really a business-like operations. Um, so you can kind of compare them to other um, income statements and balance sheets of, of public businesses that are out there. So we'll dive into each one of these major funds in just a moment. And I really do want to take the opportunity to recommend anyone that's interested in learning more about these types of funds, what the different functions of these different funds, what the purpose of using the funds are, and more importantly, sometimes what we can't use specific funds for. Um, the city has our full online budget at www.katadicity.org where there's full discussion about each one of these types of funds as well as their related budgets. Um, so fund type variances where revenues are less than 40%, expenditures are greater than 60% of budget. So general fund revenue, so that's the big piece, right? So this is where most of our, our funds come in and they go to our regular operations. Um, the difference for the revenues are primarily due to uh, sales tax receipts. As we'll go into my favorite slide um, next, where we talk about the different revenues, um, sales tax makes them pretty much 50% of our um, general fund revenues. And we've only received four of the six months of revenues because we received them two months in lag. So when you divide four by 12, you get 33%. So we really are in line with where our budget is and where it should be. We're not proposing any adjustments at this point in time. Um, capital projects are subject to a significant amount of timing, weather delays, funding sources, you know, putting things out to bid, getting better bids, you know, what we need to do to get these projects done. So. They um, can flex over different years, and so those budgets also then um, adjust according to those. And they also have to do a quick plug for everyone that wants to understand more about where our capital projects are at any point in time. We have an amazing capital projects um, portal online, and that's available. It's in the um, report here, but it's at tinyurl.com, tinyurl.com, excuse me, forward slash Katati projects. And it's amazing, it gives you timelines, projects, where they are, what the budgets are even before they go out. Um, and so it's pretty interactive and engaging and you can actually sign up to get updates on any of the projects you're interested that might be in your area. The next one um, to, that really has adjustments are those internal service revenues. 
which are different due to the timing of transfers of funds that are required for purchasing of replacements of fleet vehicles and or the compensated absences pieces that are funded primarily towards the end of the fiscal year. Um, so it's really, again, a timing piece. So getting into our general fund, so this is the mid-year analysis for that. General fund operating re revenues through the mid-year are approximately $227,000 less or 53% below the same period from 21-22. And although the revenues are only at 40% of the budget as previously discussed, this is due to the timing um, with receiving some of the larger revenue sources such as the sales tax. Um, last year, at this same point in time, we were at 34.9% of budget for revenues. Um, so I kind of already went over the sales tax, so I jumped over that in advance. Um, so overall cumulative mid-year general fund, um, alternatively the expenditures, decreased from the previous year by approximately that same 5.4% or 224000 Most of this decrease was due to the decrease in other expenses offset by the increase in our contract services, primarily related to our insurance, professional services, including um, the housing projects, as well as IT services are in, in, increasing um, professional service costs. So on packet page 135, or PDF page four of the mid-year report, there's the expenditure summary uh, that is broken out both by category, as well as by type. So overall spending for the general fund departments are consistent prior year with the noted decreases, or sorry, so by department, there's been increases in the administrative services department, the community development, and recreation. So for both the administrative services and the community development, it's primarily related to additional staff added to the team to meet the community and state reporting requirements. This increased staffing generates additional salary and benefits costs, as well as allocated um, contract services. We allocate most of our professional contract services that service the whole city based on the FTE. When your FTE increases proportionately, you're also your contract services that are allocated to those departments increases. Um, and then the recreation, of course, since COVID, they've just been doing so many more events, getting things back up and going again. And so really that is them getting back to more normal um, operations. Alternatively, spending by type in the general fund for, further shows that the uh, decrease related to the timing of transfers, which is correlated to the capital projects. We don't have to transfer out general funds monies to cover the capital projects because they've been delayed or we use our special revenue funds to fund the capital projects as much as possible and then use our general funds. Um, and this was offset by increases in contract services, other expenses, and utilities. So again, here's my little graph about our revenues here at, for our general fund. And the categories really it shows the importance of sales tax to the city. And if you can break that sales tax bar pretty much in half, you'll have the breakout between Measure S funds as well as Bradley Burns. So half of it would be our Bradley Burns stack. The other half would be um, directly due to Measure S. Um, so then on the bottom corner, you know, we have our other um, revenues that were smaller, but still increasing. So we have public safety, public works, charges for services related to those, as well as rent income and investment earnings and contributions. So that make up the bottom corner, which haven't had a significant change. Um, we did have a little bit less in code enforcement this year, but again, those change with what's happening out in the neighborhoods and what we're um, affecting for that. So transfers in, uh, just for note, it's at the 82,000. Those are derived specifically from the Public Safety Special Revenue Fund, which receives special revenue primarily from the um, Prop 172 Supplemental Law Enforcement Services, which is also called SLISA. And these are transferred in order to support law enforcement services. So um, those are specifically for law enforcement offsets that are transferred in. Moving on to our other major funds, we have the enterprise fund, again, business type operations. Um, we have the rates. 
So these are our water and sewer funds. So the following table includes the cumulative revenues and expenses in a comparison for the first half of the year. Um, the water and wastewater fund revenues are made up of a combination of charges for services, so that's the utility bills, and then connection fees and other revenues, as well as development fees. So the revenues compared to the prior year are slightly down for water, primary due to reduced connection fee revenues from the development at Kessing Ranch, um, as well as reduced water usage associated with water conservation efforts and the continued drought. So people have been using less water, the less of the variable costs, less revenue coming in to cover that cost. So comparatively, um, the wastewater is slightly up in total. That's really just due to, and I wanted to make sure I broke this out in here, is that debt payment from the water fund to the sewer fund, which is a part of our rate plan in order to put more funds into the sewer funds based on more services and projects and, and items they had. And so there was a long-term loan that was between the two funds and we did a final payment on that. So that'll be the final loan payment for that um, loan. Um, but you take that away and again, wastewater almost mirrors uh, water where it's reduced. This is again the um, reduced water usage creates less of a volume, so when we do our volume adjustment for wastewater, it also comes down when people use less water in the prior year. So that's the revenue piece for fiscal year 22-23. Mostly expenses are in line with budget. One significant difference is, again, that increased capital project and the interfund debt service in the wastewater and water fund. So that's that um, expense on the water side and the revenue in the wastewater side. And then also the increased cost for wastewater, even though we're charging less, getting less revenue, the still cost of processing the wastewater is continuing to rise. So last but not least is the cash and investments for the city as of December. So the total cash balance of our pooled cash funds, oops, let me jump forward here. Um, exceeds 19.7 million in our combined pooled funds. Um, we've made sure that these funds are held in investment uh, funds that are in line with our investment policy, um, and it well exceeds our operational needs for the next six months uh, in the fiscal year. And um, just to better explain, we have a pooled cash uh, funds, so each one of our funds does not have a separate bank account where they hold their different cash in, so it's all pulled together and based on expenses and adjustments and they, they have their balance and their funds um, in our pooled accounts. So the table herein shows, there we go, the cash and investments held by the city, um, broken out by that pool of funds, which is primarily LAIF, um, some in RBC as well as some in SKIP, so LAIF is the state's investment portfolio pool. Uh, SKIP is a Sonoma County pool. And then RBC is a, a local where we just have some CDs, but mostly cash so sitting in there right now waiting to be put into CDs as of December 31st. Alternatively, it has that same dollar amount, that 19.7 million, broken out by how it's dispersed in the pool funds, showing that the um, majority of the cash is held related to the general fund, which is about 38% of the balance, followed by the combined total for special revenues, which has approximately 20%, followed by wastewater at 19 and water at 12%. So overall, um, the budget is primarily on track. We're continuing to really dive into the budget. Um, except for identified variances, expenditures and revenues are tracking, tracking along the lines as expected. We're gonna to continue to monitor these variances and provide updated information to council during our budget development, um, which is a kind of a big piece of the beginning of the mid-year report is that we are in budget you know, thoughts right now and we have tentative schedules for budget workshops um, and this is kind of the kind of big kickoff to that before we'll go from this strategic planning, which is scheduled tentatively for March 7th, um, then followed up 
pretty quickly on April 4th with our general, general fund study session. And then April 18th, right behind it, is our enterprise fund budget study session. So we really want to make sure we're making these dates out there so we can get feedback if there's concerns, questions. Um, you know, these are things that are in the works now for the next fiscal year. So that ends my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Looking this way, questions? Let's see, right? I had a question about our, um, um, our, uh, I'm so sorry, blinking. The, um, <laughs> Just having a out of body moment. Um, I had a question about our uh, policies that we came up with to deal with pension obligation um, e bonds and um, our trust account. Are we making any contributions to that this year? We have not yet made contributions because that okay. wasn't a part of the budget process for them. So this will be a part of our study sessions and everything coming up okay. as to how we will be uh, implementing that and, and providing funding for that. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for blanking in the middle of that. It's okay. 115 trust. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, maybe I ask this too much, but it's painful to see 15 million sitting in an account bearing 0.21%. <laughs> um, is, so LAIF does not create any sort of CD equivalents that we could put some of that money into and get a little bit better return? So so one of the things, LAIF is currently has a monthly yield of uh, 2 point. Two four, oh, sorry, four two five currently right now, um, and so we are working on an investment plan. Current that's a part of our strategic objectives for this year, <laughs> and we're really trying to get to it because it is something that we want to better diversify and ladder again those investments um, and to bring council a revised investment policy and a plan to initiate some of that again. Okay, great, and you'll educate us about what our latitude is, right? I mean, we're re very restricted in what we can do with the money, right? Yes, we are highly restricted as to what we can do with our money, um, not just by our own policy, but state. Right. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Not going to the casino, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No questions. Okay. If there are no questions, I will open this up for public comment. Um, since we have lost our audience here, we will open it up to comments, uh, the audience on Zoom. Please Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you would like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand icon. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, so this is to receive the fiscal year 2022-23 mid-year budget review and approve proposed budget adjustments, but you did not recommend any is the way I read this, am I correct? So we are just to receive this. So duly received. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mayor Harvey, a, a hand came up at the very oh, end. Okay. I don't know if we want to. Alrighty. Now it's back down. Excuse me. Oops. <laughs> Maybe for the next item. Up down, up down. All right. Okay. So then we will move on to the next item, which is review of the uh, draft city seal. So who is, oh, <laughs> why, hi there, Damien. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So this is um, an item about uh, the draft city seal. So quick, uh, first a quick walk down memory lane. Um, many, many years ago, we started working on this and um, that put us in initial touch with the, um, the Federated Indians of the Great and Rancheria where we had run an initial design by them. Um, it was a, basically an updated likeness of the Chief Katadi um, uh, seal that we currently have. So the feedback from the tribe was that they did not want us to um, continue with that seal. They'd, you know, they'd, they want us to move to some other type of imagery for our city, for our city seal. So um, this was happening about the same time that we were doing our, um, our logoing work. Our logoing work, um, which you're all, I think, all aware of, that split off and went forward and got completed. Um, and this one had this sort of reset and, you know, take a new path. And so that's, that's where, that's kind of what led up to where we are today. Um, so we started working on some new options that um, 
that was looking at something different. And back in August of 2022, uh, 2022, we had put out some some real just general um, concepts to get people's feedback. This was an online survey that we did, as well as a, um, a council meeting that we had in November that we also talked about this. The themes that were represented were a music theme, a nature theme, and a landmarks theme, just generally um, categorized that way. And the community, based on the community survey, the public largely supported a nature-based theme of some type. Um, and in the real just concepty thing that um, we were discussing at that time, it was represented by an oak tree. The second most popular theme being um, music of some type as a general sort of theme. And this was, um, this was represented in initial concept as just sort of the top part of the statue of, uh, of Boggio, the one that's in the Plaza Park, the accordion player. Um, the prevailing sentiment was that the oak trees are an important element, but that um, the tree was already, it's already, hi already highly used by several other communities in this area, including um, Windsor and Oakland. So maybe a, an important element, but not the primary focus of the seal. And um, <clears throat> while people liked music, they thought that it should be, um, the general sentiment was more timeless and universal, not any particular person like the uh, statue we have in La Plaza Park. There was also significant public comment about incorporating Katati's hexagon layout into the seal, and this was um, when we got to the November meeting of the city council, the city council took in all, all this feedback and um, also agreed that a, um, creating a draft seal centered on the nature theme would be important, um, and also um, with a strong, with strong direction to include the hexag hexagonal shape um, the, the ones we were looking at before were circular um, borders on the seals and, um, and then potentially an element with, uh, that would tie in local native um, culture. So um, that brings us to today. Um, and as a result, the, the graphic artist that we have been working with um, did incorporate the hexagonal shape into the border of the um, draft concepts that you see in the packet. And uh, Kevin, if you put this on the screen, please. And um, they center on, the concept art centers on the, uh, the nature theme. So, so what you, um, I'll just focus on, the, on what's basically inside the hexagon first. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what you see is, uh, what you see is that the hexagonal shape of the seal um, and then rather than have the city of Katadi and the incorporation year around the perimeter of the, um, of the circular seal, it's incorporated through a banner and then, um, you know, down below, you'd be sort of um, incorporated that way. Um, this shows, uh, this is, again, just a rough hand-drawn depiction of what would be the, like the laguna running through the middle, uh, the hills, agriculture, um, some trees, and the bandstand representing um, the musical element. The, the type of art that would be, um, that this would eventually evolve into in final form is a scratch art form. So um, if you could scroll to the last one. This is, just, uh, this is just an example of the type of art. So it wouldn't be this rough, kind of rough hand drawn, it'd be more the kind of crisp scratch art style in its final form. Um, each one of these that were in the packet and that um, that we have on the screen here tonight are the the interior art is the same, and that's um, primarily what we're trying to get feedback on tonight is um, is where we want to go with the interior art if um, if we're happy with it if there's anything that we want to include in there. Um, the border can be uh, because the main reason is because this is a commissioned piece of art, so we need to finalize that piece. The border can we can play with that for years if we wanted to. I, hopefully not, <laughs> but but uh, please don't tell them that. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, ideally we could just pick like what we want and just move forward with it tonight. So what? Um, so in terms of borders, what we have is we have some different just some different options. Some are um, uh, native uh, themed. The, the ones I would pick out, the ones I would just point out that are already incorporated in some of the public art that we have out there today are this, this is the second one that is um, 
can you go to the second option? Yeah, so this, that is um, what's currently on the top of the mosaic wall that's at the corner of Old Redwood Highway 116. So that already exists in the public space and it has, uh, it definitely has a very native connotation. Um, the other thing that's in the public space, if you want to go down a couple, is um, this just, again, the mosaic wall kind of brings in a mosaic idea. And then if you go down one more, if we don't want any sort of native imagery around the outside of the hexagon, this is just a simple um, thought pattern. This is what the um, original concepts back in August and the council reviewed in November had, um, just this simple dot pattern around the perimeter. And um, I will just say that just internally, this is very, very unscientific, but um, internally from a staff perspective, uh, the one that uh, has it's the second one with the um, native imagery that's already in the public space. Um, that's sort of a sort of one of the prevailing staff favorite. And um, another option to think about is, because I know this came up before, is some animal themes. That's something that could even be put in there at a small scale. Because remember, this will large, large, largely be presented in a very small scale, like on letterhead or business cards and that sort of thing. So there's not, you don't want to put too many elements in there. So it's clear what you're, what you're conveying, but you know, you could do something fun and have like a little Easter egg rooster or something in there somewhere. But um, anyway, with that, I will just uh, stop there and I'm happy to try to answer any questions if you have any. Questions? Um, I have a question about, uh, I, I appreciate having a laguna in there. I think that's a really good um, kind of naturescape to include. It's important to Katani. Um, I have a question on the the basket weed, the Native American border design. Was that something that was run through the Federal Indians of Great Rancheria? Uh, the one that we used over, you said it's already been used. Do you know if that was also kind of? Yeah, um, so when the wall was, um, when the wall was designed, they looked at a lot of different um, basket weave patterns, mm -hmm. and um, and that was the one that was selected as both both the mo the most representative of a local basket weave, but also would depict the best on a wall. Okay. And um, to your question specifically, if the tribe had approved it, I were don't, they part of the review process? I don't. I mean, we definitely gave it to them. I don't recall specifically if they approved it. They don't generally like approve things. They'll just gen generally tell us if they don't like it. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. That's what I have for right now. Okay. Dan. No. Or? Yeah. Well, so another question on the, along those same lines. Do we know if that um, weave it, pattern is um, uh, connected to the Coast Miwok or the Pomo or, or what tribe it comes from. But that was the that was the intent when the wall was being uh -huh. designed. Was that it was a local um, coastal Miwok Pomo tribe okay. pattern. Okay. Um, and then my other question was the um, the, the hand drawn art. I really like the artwork on that. And then the last one that's more of the scratch style. Um, it's superficially similar, and it's got the laguna and the agriculture and the trees and the bandstand, but somehow I, I don't like it as much. <laughs> so my question is, is it intended that when we go to the scratch art, it's going to stay a little closer to the previous draw, like the hand-drawn drawings that are in the packet? Y yeah, absolutely. That's, okay. I, I hesitated to even put the scratch art in there because it was really just like taking pieces of art and just dropping it into a yeah. picture. So that it's not, it doesn't flow together yeah. well it's like a, you know a stream that goes across the tops of hills which water doesn't flow uphill you know <laughs> so it has those kind of like issues when you look at it um yeah. i was just really trying to convey that it's a crisper kind of look when it's in its okay. final form yeah thank you okay yeah quick question um i just i couldn't tell is the intention i'm i'm a big fan of two also i think that's the, the um but my question is is the the kind of flowy thing down the middle, is that meant to be a creek or is that meant to be a path? Um, it's, it's meant to be a creek, yeah. Thank you. That's it? Okay. Then we will open this up for public comment and seeing that we don't have one 
in the audience here. Uh, please raise your hand online. I see we have hands popping up, so Kevin, I'll let you manage that. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Uh, yes, please, Zoom attendees, use the raise hand icon if you'd like to make a public comment. We'll start with Jenny Blaker. Please go ahead. Hello. Thanks so much for the opportunity to comment. Um, I haven't been following this until now, so I was really interested that it had got so far, and I, I very much appreciated the discussion and the focus on including nature and music and <clears throat> the Coast Miwok influence. Um, I go along with the staff and I think it was uh, Laura, I forget. So um, anyway, option two with the double triangles seems to me, I think to be, um, I like it the best. And I also think it's probably the closest to the Coast Miwok. Um, design, but like, uh, as um, Commissioner Lamer said, Council Member Lamer said, uh, it would be good to check in with the tribe and at least see if they have any objection. But um, I'd go for option two. On the internal art, um, I like the scratch drawings of the oak trees more than the kind of very general cartoony looking trees in the others, which you can't really tell are oak trees. Um, but I also wondered if maybe there could be some trees along the edge of the creek, because given that one of the features in Katadi is the Laguna Trail with the shading from the trees, and the creek on these is, is very, like, open, just going through what looks like bare soil <laughs> or grass, it would be really nice if there were some trees beside the creek as well. Um, I think that's all my comments. So I really like the direction this is going and all the elements that are being included. So um, thank you for all the work on this. Thank you for that. Marie McNaughton, please go ahead. Good evening. Um, I want to applaud Katati's move away from the generic California Indian image. Um, I've spent nearly 20 years studying and writing about Katati history and really applaud anything that steers away from Chief Katati, who was not a historical person, but probably a cartoon kind of image created in the mid 20th century by non-Indigenous people. Um, so that makes me very happy. I also like that the seal will be a hexagon because reflecting the city's very unusual city center. It may be unique in the Americas. Um, it's certainly rare even on a global scale to have a hexagon in the middle of a city. Um, the central drawing on packet page 160, which people seem to be steering away from, I do like because it includes oak trees, Laguna waters and plants, as well as modern agricultural rows on the bottom of the art in the hexagonal bandstand reference, which is a comprehensive view of our community. Um, the repeated triangle border option on page 156 of the packet, I think best reflects the Coast Miwok aesthetic as seen in traditional objects. And I would love to see the city slash artist actually look at basketry made by Coast Miwoks, which is available um, to be studied and see the actual angles of the triangles in those that are not quite as mathy geometric -y as the one that's being used here. But overall, I'm very excited about these changes. Um, one last thing I wondered about was what, why the hexagon corners are being rounded. Um, that's not exactly something that our streets do, and I think it softens what's a very strong kind of look that speaks to mandalas and other kinds of mythic elements. So thank you for the opportunity to weigh in, and thank you for making this move towards a more modern 21st century view of Katati. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. All right. Thank you. I don't 
see anyone else. Okay. I just wanted to be sure and no more hands went up. So bring it back to the group. Thoughts? Yes, Laura, go for it. Well, I don't want anyone to think that we in Katati are weak because of our rounded corners. So. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's an option that maybe when this comes back the last time, maybe we could see one with the tight corners and one with rounded corners just to compare them. I don't know if that's reasonable or what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the in terms of the interior art, they probably can do art that would just fit in either shape. Yeah. And then the, then we can just throw a border, a different, if the council wants. You can see it both ways. I don't think it would hurt anything. Um, I, I I agree. I like the the design that everyone's been referring to on packet page 156. And my last comment is I would like to see a rooster weather vane Easter egg added to the top of the van stand. <laughs> Did I hear you say you want an Easter egg? Well, Easter egg in the sense of a, a little secret that you can oh, only okay. see if you look right. closely. I'm just, okay. <laughs> Got it. I do not want a literal Easter egg. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Okay. Uh, I, I agree with Marie. I think it would be better to have a sharper corners on, um, but I also, uh, on number on packet page 156, um, option two still is my favorite. Um, and I did notice that the rooster, the weather vane was not there as well. <laughs> And um, however, I do recognize that, you know, I'm looking at our name tag and the seal is like smaller than a fingernail. So, um, you know, I do understand that those kind of tiny elements are not gonna be um, visible, but I still think I, I like the idea of it being there nonetheless. Um, but yeah, definitely option two is, um, I, I like um, the sort of flowy, um, you know, nature of the water and, um, uh, you know, the structure is very recognizable um, as our grandstand. And um, I think it's, and I really love the native element on the outside and I, I agree with Marie about the, the sharper edges. But otherwise, I really like that one a lot. Thank you. I can't wait for Laura to find her Easter egg on her name tag. <laughs> Sylvia? Sure, yeah, I'm not sure I fully agree with the sharp edges. I would like to look at it because yeah. as Marie was talking, I was drawing it on here and it's like, it looks like a stop sign. So I even wrote stop in the middle. So I think it depends, you know, but I would I would welcome looking at a, a version of it. But I definitely do like the Native American border on it. I think that would be important to include to kind of pay homage to the original people of the land. Um, and I do also like, like I said, the Laguna. Um, and I agree with um, Vice Mayor about how the last one was almost like almost like a children's book, like illustration, like a children's book, versus the other one, it, it spoke to me better, I think, the other type of, um, the initial artist rendering of it. Thank you. Ben. Great. Uh, I also like the general direction. I had a, I was in the earlier discussion, so I knew that the thing down the middle was supposed to be the Laguna, but it <laughs> looks more like a path with weeds growing along the edge. So <laughs> that, that, the, the, scratch art version at the back, the, the reeds along the water look better than the reeds in the hand-drawn version. So anyway, make the Laguna look more like the Laguna. Um, to your specific question about feedback on the internal art, um, I agree with, with Jenny Blaker that, that uh, trees ought to be closer to the creek, not far away, and that more mimics how they actually grow. And um, Given the size it will be eventually printed at, I would opt for fewer trees and more central overhang, you know, so overhanging the, the laguna. Um, although maybe the laguna has to bend a little different so you can still see the, the bandstand. Um, I also like uh, border option two with, if possible, as uh, Marie suggested, um, get the get the artist some pictures of actual baskets and see if we can, how close we can get them. Um, there are no, I've, I've looked at satellite pictures of our hub and there are no sharp, sharp corners on the hexagon. So if we do bring back a sharp corner version, 
Also include a satellite picture of the hub, please, because this looks a lot more like what it actually looks like than a sharp corner hexagon. Um, I think I prefer the rounded version myself, but, uh, but it's not a big deal. I really like the banner with the city of Katati rather than wrapping it around the outside. I think that was a brilliant way to handle the difficulty of wrapping a hexagon. Um, so I really like the overall direction. I think the interior art is a little too busy for what we're hoping for. So I don't want to add more trees. I just want to fewer and closer to the creek. That's all. Yeah, thanks. OK. Well, do you have what you need? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I do. I thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, I do see one more hand up, so I'm willing to open this. I, I know, but maybe she had something to add, so I would hate to. So if you could please let Marie. Uh, Marie, you uh, have the floor if you'd like to continue your public comment. I apologize. I did not mean to add it, um, and I'm... <laughs> I, I love all of your comments, and I'm glad we don't necessarily agree on everything, but we're headed in the right direction together. Thank you. Can I make one other request? Sure. Is that when a final version comes back, that it also come back in the size we'll actually see it? Yeah. yeah. I was I was trying to put mine up as far away as I could. <laughs> put it over there. Yeah. Didn't really do the trick. And will will it be in color? Or will it be in black and white? Uh, it could be either way. So it will be designed to be colorized or black and white. Okay. That would be the intent, so it could be shown each okay. either way. Yeah. Just curious. All right, so staff has what they need on this. You don't need anything other than this direction. Are you directed enough? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm good. So I will <clears throat> um, I'll direct them to uh, make those changes, and then we'll come back and hopefully have the final. Yes, okay. Uh oh, she's going to change her mind now. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, I, just uh, building on what you just said, it, when, you know, one tiny, like it's going to look, and one far away so we can see it, but also, would it be possible to see color and black and white? Because this is all going to be color, right? Uh, or do we need, is that later? Yeah, um, it, pro it probably would be easy to do, I would think. I mean, okay. once they do the artwork, it, yeah, I think that'd be easy. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, we ready to move on now? All righty then. So we will now move on to um, item C, recommend appointment to the Board of Trustees for the Marin, Sonoma, Mosquito, and Vector Control District. Yes. Damien, are you taking this? I am, I am, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the Council, so we've finally gotten to the item that we've all been waiting for. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, all right, so we, um, there's a mosquito, uh, Sonoma, Marin Sonoma Mosquito and Vector Control District, actually based right here in Katati, right on Hellman Lane behind Lowe's. If you've never been there, it's um, actually, they do tours and it's pretty interesting. Um, if you want to bag a mosquito fish or just want to learn about pest controls, it's actually a very informative tour. Um, anyway, so we have a, um, as a member of the district, we have a seat on, on the Board of Trustees. We have uh, for, I think for, it's been a couple of years now we've been trying to get someone to um, fill that vacancy. And um, in discussions with the mayor, uh, she volunteered to step up and take one for the team and, um, and put her name in for the Board of Trustees spot. So this, um, this board does meet monthly, and it meets right here in Katati, off of, uh, right off Hellman Lane. And um, it's the second Wednesday of each month. And uh, the, details, um, the details are in the packet. I won't go through them unless somebody has a question about it. But um, <clears throat> the, only, uh, the only real option is a two- or four-year appointment. Um, and speaking with the mayor, she was willing to do a four-year appointment, so that's what's in the packet. And uh, with that, I'd just be happy to answer any questions, if there are any. Yes, Ben. Well, I'm curious about this recommending. I thought we were the appointing body. Why are we recommending and not just appointing? Oh, um, we are appointing. Okay, so we yeah. would just be moving to appoint yes. Mayor Harvey. Okay, that's right. Yep. An extra word. Yeah. Okay, Laura, any questions? No? 
I will open this up for public comment. There's no one here in the audience, so I'll let you take it away. Kevin. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand icon. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Uh, thank you for that. So I will bring it back to see what the pleasure of the council is. We're going to have a knockdown, drag out fight. Right? Oh, are you? Okay. <laughs> All righty then. This is not quite as exciting as some of the other earlier things, huh? <laughs> I'd be happy to make a motion if. Okay. Uh, I move that we appoint Mayor Harvey to the Board of Trustees for the Marin Sonoma Mosquito and Vector Control District for a term of four years. I second with gratitude to yes. the mayor. <laughs> it's just been vacant for so long, and we've tried and tried and tried, and, you know, I just, we need to have a full board. So with that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Does it not need to be seconded? It was. It was. It was. Aye. <laughs> any no's? Not seeing any no's. Any abstentions? All in, everyone said aye, so we passed this unanimously. Oh, boy. So thank you for that. So I'll let you know how that goes, a morative report. Um, yeah, congratulations. Oh, gee, thank you. So with that, we will move on to the city manager's report. So I have some, um, I have some pretty exciting news to share. Um, one, of our, one of our officers, one of our police officers, was just recognized as the Sonoma County Law Enforcement Officer of the Year. Oh, so that's, wow. um, that's huge, of all the nine municipal agencies plus the two college agencies, plus the sheriff. Um, so they select among all of them <laughs> who they want to appoint. And uh, Officer Renke um, was, was uh, recognized. And this was for um, specifically for the missing persons case, for the uh, woman that was um, trapped in Humboldt County and was rescued just in the nick of time before she um, froze to death, or didn't she didn't freeze to death, but they got to her just in time, so that was um, that was anyway just a great job, and it was recognized by all the law enforcement agencies in Sonoma County, and it's a huge deal. So um, I don't know that we've ever had an officer that's been recognized as officer of the year. So yeah, N neither do I. So it's, anyway, big news, um, <clears throat> and then uh, just. Quick updates on a couple projects. The West Sierra sewer main project, it's pretty close to wrapping up. They're just doing some remaining point repairs on some of the older sewer line segments around the main project area. Otherwise, it's complete. Um, the Pocket Park, Megan's Pathway, that's nearly complete too. They're just waiting on a couple um, items, and that's the fountain and some lighting and things. That's They're long lead time items, and they're almost here. So hopefully those will be in here shortly, and they'll get installed, and the project will be will be done. Um, the window project that you can see along West Sierra, so that um, that's being done to repair water damage around the windows and upgrade the windows for energy efficiency and noise reduction. Um, those windows are all in now. Um, they just need to be weather sealed, um, some trim work and um, uh, stucco, but that one's moving along nicely. Um, the Civic Center window replacement project will uh, start soon. And then um, Katadi Park refurbishment that's been um, going. So if you've gone out there, the central grass area, of course, is still untouched, but um, all the playground and landscape areas around the perimeter have all been, for the most part, graded or um, starting to be prepped. So there's a lot of work going on, going on out there at the park. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, as the council knows, you recently awarded some um, some pretty large road construction project contracts, and those will get going in the next uh, month or month and a half. One being the West Sierra reconstruction. There's many names for it, um, but I'll just keep it simple. It's West Sierra and La Plaza. Those those two ring roads are, are getting done. We're also, um, by the way, we're also working with Comcast to get um, internet into the park, into La Plaza Park, so that there'll be public Wi-Fi there. And we're so we've been working with them to get it ahead of the paving, so they don't destroy the paving to put the Wi-Fi in. Um, so hopefully by the summer the road, um, the plan is by the summer the road will be repaved um, and there'll be Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi in the park. Also, um, the other big reconstruction project that um, the council recently awarded was um, primarily 
it's the area primarily around Myrtle, so Myrtle will be fully reconstructed as well as some streets off um, on the south side of Myrtle. And that will um, finish the road reconstruction work on that quadrant of town, so that will be, um, that'll be huge, a huge accomplishment. Um, the housing element, as, um, as the council knows, that was submitted to the state in, um, in November. And that 90-day review period is going to be ending here. Um, it should be this week. We should be getting comments back from HCD. And so look for, um, look for that in the very near future. We'll bring bringing it forward for planning commission and council approval. And um, uh, we don't have hard dates yet when that's going to happen. We'll, we need to see what all the comments are going to be. Um, we did post some revi the revised housing element on the website. And that incorporates some of the um, informal comments that we've already gotten from the state verbally. But um, we'll know for sure when we get the letter this week. So um, lastly, today, um, I think everyone knows, is Valentine's Day Day. It's, there's Hershey's Kisses all around this place, <laughs> thanks to one of our council members. Um, but earlier today, we, uh, we did deliver uh, 60 Valentine's, Valentine grams throughout Katahdi. So a lot of that car was packed full of uh, Valentine's Day grams. And um, it was uh, it, it's flowers, uh, cookies, goodies, personalized card. And um, it was a sellout success as it has been in the last couple of years. And we got a um, yeah, we actually got some we got a voicemail from some of the residents that loved it. So already today, which is kind of rare. You don't usually get voicemails from people. They love their Valentine's Day grams. So that was that was good. <laughs> And then um, we're also doing bunny grams again this year where you can send um, baskets, like Easter baskets, to people in, um, in Katahdi. So that's stuffed eggs, candy treats, and, um, and more. So if anyone's interested in that, sign up early because those also sell out. Um, we also have bunny brunch and the egg hunt coming up on April 1st. That's Saturday. Registration is already open and it's filling up. Um, we have two sessions in the morning, 9 and 945. And um, it's scrambled eggs, pancakes, sausage, fruit, drinks, that sort of thing for breakfast um, with the Easter Bunny. The Easter Bunny will be there. <laughs> so uh, that's, part of the, that's part of the deal. And an egg hunt that's outside. Um, and you can take photos with the bunny if you'd like. This also sells out, so reserve your space if you're interested in that. And then um, just on the heels of that, we have spring break camp coming up. Um, we also, we're, we're doing two camps, um, Camp Katati Spring Break Camp and the spring break Spanish camp um, offered this year. And then we have a bunch of other camps coming up at the Veranda Flitty Ranch, a community camp out at the ranch. Um, but you do have to sign up for that. You can't just like show up and camp out there. Um, and the community yard sale will also be coming up. That's a, basically like a, a giant garage sale here at City Hall. And the proceeds benefit our recreation programming. Um, and if anyone has any questions or wants more information on the recreation events, they can always contact our rec department at 665-4222 uh, or awilsonekatadicity.org or register on the city website on the rec desk page that we have on our website. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Seeing none, thank you. My grandkids love the Valentine Grams. They called me. They were very excited. So um, Ashley and her team did a great job. So appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to comment on um, Ryan, uh, Officer Enke. Um Just last week, a drunk driver smashed into three cars in front of our house, um, losing the wheel off of his truck. It was pretty crazy and then proceeded to drive another half mile down our brand new beautiful road without a tire. So that was pretty impressive. Um, and he came and he was amazing. And, um, you know, I just followed the grind on the road to find where <laughs> it ended. Um, and, but he was just super amazing. And I'm wondering, I don't know, um, do we have any kind of city council mayor commendation or anything that we could we could award him? Is that something that our city does or could do? Uh, we, so we don't uh, have anything specific like that, but um, I think you know as the de as we get more details on how the officer of the year award thing will happen, we could potentially have him. Um, I'm, I'm kind of speaking out of turn. I haven't talked to the chief about it. But we could potentially have him here. <laughs> and just recognize them that way at one of our council meetings. 
And remember, um, Officer Rinky was the Katati Employee of the Year, and much of it was be behind what happened with the investigations, because the department heads uh, ultimately chose Ryan. So he has been um, recognized by the city, but um, if council wants to recognize officers, I'm not gonna stand in your way. <laughs> I think this is really above and beyond, and I think it's wonderful that we have an officer in our city, so I think that we should do whatever it is that uh, you and Damien decide appropriate. Um, I think the council would, would support that because what he did was way above and beyond. I mean, he was going to do everything within his physical and mental power to ensure that that young lady um, got back to her family, which was really amazing. So, yeah, I, right. I, I, I would be sorry. I, yeah. I don't mean to drag this out, but okay. um, I, I will have to say that same night we had two accidents. We had one person hit the pole here on the corner, but right in front of the Church of the Oaks, <laughs> which you knew about because um, the wires are hanging a little low for a bit till they. Well, I'm still working on that. And the other was the one that was in your neighborhood that was you know ping bonging off cars. Yeah, down the street, which, um, uh, which was awful too. But you know, with with the grind, in the grinding of the asphalt. I mean, just because I know the level of investment that goes into <laughs> repaving those roads and how hard it is to get that money together to make those kind of investments, it it killed me. So, I mean, of course, people's car damage hurts too. But look at the road. I, I tend to do that. I look at the road and I'm like, oh, really. Like, so soon, I mean, the asphalt's barely cold. This one has to grind a nice gouge through it. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> right. That was it. Yeah, the one other thing I just want to say about that is it was just miraculous that nobody got hurt. Like, no no animals, no people, it, a lot of property damage, but no people. And that was, you know, because some guy was following him from Adrian and Runner Park. He was like driving that whole way like that. So it's really, I feel very fortunate that no one got hurt. Okay, with that, then we will move on to city council member reports. Do you sure, I went to a few meetings uh, this month as an alternate and some primary. February 2nd, I went to the Sonoma Clean Power Authority meeting. It was an online meeting. Um, I didn't stay for the full meeting, but they uh, talked about how community engagement will be increased in targeted areas. Um, on, also in a second, I did go to Housing 101, which is a program that was put on by Generation Housing. That was really good. It was almost a full day program with a lot of the housing laws and initiatives, and they had different um, nonprofits and attorneys on housing speaking about the new uh, rules coming into play. Uh, so that was really good in a second. I went on February 6th to the WAC TAC meeting, the water um, advisory committee, and on the 9th, uh, as an alternate to the Mayors and Council Members Association, um, the 10th to the Groundwater Sustainability Association meeting, and then I just went before this meeting to the Katadi Chamber of Commerce uh, meeting as a representative. So, um, meetings are starting. So, <laughs> glad to glad to be uh, of help. Ben, well, I'll just mention that um, Sonoma Clean Power is uh, really a leader in the state in trying to. Uh, you know what the current challenge with the electrical our electrical supply situation is solar is great for six hours a day and what do you do the rest of the time so Sonoma Clean Power with our geothermal resources that you know that's why we have good 24 7 renewable power in our region but ramping that up is a big challenge and especially that what we approved in the consent calendar tonight is a, a proposal for a grant to to uh, build a project that would uh, be a first of its kind to to have a way to uh, use the geothermal heat during the day but store that heat rather than immediately turning it into electricity and turn it into electricity when the need on the grid is, is highest. So uh, if that technology gains a foothold, it could be huge in smoothing out the power demand curve and reducing the need for natural gas plants. So Sonoma Clean Power continues to do pretty impressive work. Okay, do you have any report? Um, no, mine are coming up. Okay. Laura? 
Um, I attended the Water Advisory Committee meeting. It was a pretty short meeting. They were done in about an hour. And, wow. Uh, <laughs> that was a record. <laughs> So, uh, good news, I think we're all aware that the lakes are full, Sonoma, uh, Lake Sonoma is almost entirely full as of the last meeting, so that's fantastic news, and um, yeah, I don't think too much to report. Is there anything important you wanted to uh, mention? Yeah, the biggest binder. <laughs> yeah, a big binder. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that uh, City Manager Obit is working on it, and I think uh, what you told me was that uh, we don't have Runnett Park on for it yet, but I was going to reach out and see if they wanted to perhaps join us. Yeah, I, I think it's going to go the other way around. We're going to be scheduled first, and they can join if they can. Yeah. Great. Uh, SK? Yeah, I just thought I'd go ahead and just mention that in case anyone wants to join me, um, the library committee is going to be meeting on the 21st. At, I believe at 5 p.m. at the Rancho, or sorry, not Rancho Katati, the Runner Park. Katati Library. Um, I don't even think it's called Katati anymore. The <laughs> Runner well, Park Library in Runner Park. <laughs> All right. So I um, attended the SCTA RCPA meeting, and after. <laughs> three hours my head was about ready to explode got a lot to learn there they were giving a report on their annual stuff and um, grants that they've been applying for and things like that but nothing very specific for us but boy they do an awful lot of stuff um, so that was pretty pretty incredible um, I attended the mayors and council members meeting and thank you Sylvia for jumping in there I had the worst internet that night I got popped out of zoom three times and kept having to get back in so Sylvia jumped in on one vote for me when I couldn't I couldn't vote so and again appreciate the staff on the Valentine Grams um, my grandkids loved them and called and were very excited so that's all I have to report. Oh, and Damien is going to, since I am not available on Thursday, Damien is going to go to the Waste Management Agency meeting for me. <laughs> it'll be fun, Damien. It'll be fun. So, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. So, um, Now we will move on to um, public comments on non-action agenda items. So um, we'll start with the Zoom attendees first. Thank you, Mayor Harvey. If you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand icon. Neil Hancock, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, good. It's a new headset I'm trying. Um, so I'd like to say thank you for the Wi-Fi, for the city putting in the Wi-Fi. It's some five years since I went to a meeting where there was a, a, a technology type meeting trying to figure out how do you reach the rest of um, the people who haven't got um, easy access to um, data. And this is something that will really help with anybody who's, let's say, just hasn't got a regular data plan. It's also some 20 years since I was going around talking to people saying, um, have you got Wi-Fi? And they looked at me and, and said, are you a hacker? We don't allow those around <laughs> here. <laughs> that was both within Britain and, and here. So I think that's a really excellent that there's a, um, an access um, for that locally in the park. There used to be the dental that did it. Um, I'd also like to commend the city for talking or supporting the Sonoma Clean Power and the superheating, figuring out a way of storing that energy by superheating the uh, the steam beforehand. That really was interesting to read about, and I did some more research. So thank you very much. Thank you for that. Mayor Harvey, that'll end Zoom public comment. Okay. And then members of the audience, if you would like to make a comment on non-action agenda items, you may please step forward to the podium. Okay. That's quite all right. Just wanted to give you that option. So with that, I will bring it back and we will move on to information received after the agenda was posted. 
Do we have anything of note other than what was given to us? There's a letter that was given to you um, and posted online. That's the okay. only um, information received. Okay. With that, if no one has anything else, I will adjourn this meeting at, let's see, 831. And happy Valentine's Day and let you all get back to your families. So thank you. Thank you. Recording.